Breakdown Podcast. Penn Lies, Nittany Lions Football Podcast. Taking it into mid-February, I'm Bob Flounders, uh, joined by Greg Pickle. Uh, it is the middle of the week. It is late Wednesday morning as we talk about this, Greg. Um, I can see, uh, judging by the look in your eyes, that you survived your friend Joe's Super Bowl party. I was over there for a little bit before the game. I was a little worried about you guys because you guys are pretty cranked up. Glad to see you got through it. You look hale and hearty. Plenty of Penn State football to talk about. Uh, am I correct in the assumption that you're feeling good a couple days after the Super Bowl and Lola's doing well? Feeling good. Everything's going well, Bob. And there's more Penn State news to talk about, even though we're not quite to spring practice yet. So the fun rolls on. Yeah. And I think the, I think the listeners – uh, and the viewers are probably noticing uh, a lack of theme music, uh, even though Joe Hermit was threatening to kind of deliver on, on that request that I had. We're not asking for 20 minutes of theme music, Joe. We're not asking for Bruce Springsteen. But how about a little intro, a little outro music, just to get the fan base excited? So uh, I kind of feel like you're letting us down. So let's let's get on that, Joe. I want to say... By the start of next month, I'd like some theme music. Greg, let's get into this. There's a lot of ways we can go to start this. But I think things. I think one of the things that people still are talking about, <clears throat> uh, my sense is, is a player that's no longer on the roster. Uh, Will Levis uh, wasn't the starter last year, played last year. But he was a guy that helped Penn State. He was a guy that couldn't beat out Sean Clifford. He did have a couple of chances. He looked good in spots. He was really uh, like a designated short yardage running specialist by the end of the year in Kirk Shiraka's offense. Entered the transfer portal a couple weeks ago, Greg. Um, surfaces at Kentucky in the SEC. That's a, that's a school, uh, and that's a, that's a program that likes to use the running quarterback a little bit. I think when Penn State played in the Citrus Bowl and they lost to Kentucky a couple years ago, I believe they had a pretty mobile quarterback. First of all, your thoughts just on, uh, I know you've talked about it, and I know we've talked about this, but it, even though, you know, Sean Clifford is, is, is going to be the guy, if he stays healthy, going into 2021 in Mike Yersich's new offense, part of me feels like the, the most physically talented quarterback on Penn State's roster just walked out the doors in the SEC. I'm not saying the most accomplished. I'm saying the most physically talented. So how big of a loss do you think this is for Penn State? Yeah, you know, he joins a Kentucky program, Bob, where they've had their own quarterback transfer issues. So he's going to have as good a shot as any to win that starting job. I mean, look, I guess I look at it like this. We saw Will Levis do some pretty nice things, but he still ended his Penn State career with more rushing attempts and passing attempts. Yeah. Not his fault, of course. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes it felt like he had – as strong of, strong of an arm as anyone, but the accuracy wasn't always there. Right. And I think that when you look at everything he accomplished, certainly he had the ta there, there was talent there, whether it was ever going to materialize into the kind of play yeah. that would lead you to a Big Ten title or the college football playoff, you know, we'll see. But yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, the talent, absolutely there. And the physical ability, absolutely there. Was he more talented than Sean Clifford? I think you can make some arguments both well, ways yeah. just based on how he was used. I mean, he wasn't. John's used. talented too, but I mean, Will, Will, I thought it, like 230, uh, look, look physically like he was more equipped to run, more decisive, more fearless as a runner, uh, had a strong arm. Sean, obviously, Sean Clifford, when he's been healthy, has played very well for Penn State, but his, I would say his year was up and down at best in 2020. I'm just wondering, I guess what I'm really wondering is, is this a bigger loss maybe to – we're talking about a player that wasn't going to start, but is this a bigger loss maybe than people, uh, Penn State fans, realize? Yeah, I don't think so. I really don't. I think that if Mike Yurcich really thought he could be Penn State's starting quarterback, he would have done a good enough recruiting job yeah. along with James Franklin to keep Will Levis in State College. Now, is it possible that Will Levis said, hey, I appreciate all of the feedback, but I'm not yeah. staying here anyway? Yeah, absolutely it is, but – 
it strikes me as interesting that he waited until after the offensive coordinator change was made to move on. I think the other thing, too, is that Mike Yersich has a prototype in mind. I'm not terribly sure that Will Levis is it. I don't know if Sean Clifford is it, but I think he might be closer <laughs> to it than Levis is. And so, you know, Mike Yersich is also going to want to bring his own guys in. Now, whether that's through the yeah. transfer portal this year, next year, um, you know, he's really expanded their class of 2022 quarterback offering. Bo Prabola is in that class already. You know, so even if Will Levis won the job this year, there was always going to be competition coming. So I understand why he transferred. It leaves them in a spot where, you know, Taquan Roberson didn't get any game reps. I know you and I, when we get feedback through our subtext and from subscribers, mailbags and things like that, a lot of people were begging, basically, for Penn State to give Taquan Roberson a look in some of those late season games just to see what they had there. For whatever reason, that never happens. So, yeah, it's certainly not ideal to be in a spot where you have one quarterback on scholarship with game experience. But, you know, is it a big loss? It, I It's hard for me to go too overboard with that just simply because how they used him. Okay. Well, then, Greg, let's move this along here on the blue-white breakdown uh, and talk about another loss, but it's a coaching loss. And the shoe, the the, the you know, the – We've learned the identity of Penn State's new tight ends coach. So Tyler Bowen going to the NFL to work on uh, uh, Urban Meyer's staff at Jacksonville. I don't think there's any doubt that when he was at Penn State, uh, you know, James Franklin had this one right. He, he, he likes him. He liked a lot about him. And I think Tyler uh, was impressive in a short amount of time, whether it was coaching Penn State's tight ends, uh, developing Penn State's tight ends, whether it was pinch hitting for Ricky Ronnie as the OC in the Cotton Bowl when Ricky Ronnie went to Old Dominion. It's hard to argue with uh, Penn State scoring all those points in that, in that one game audition. And then finally, just, just as a recruiter, you look at, you know, not just what he's done uh, kind of stocking uh, the shells uh, for tight ends in future recruiting classes, but also, you know, other, other recruits. You know, he also, I think, I think I think he could all he was a he was versatile because I think he could help with the offensive line. I think he did a lot of things right during his time at Penn State. So he's at Jacksonville, and there a lot of people were wondering what what James would do, who would be the guy. And he didn't take too long, but it's a former Penn State offensive lineman, Ty Howell. I think he was a center. I don't know. I think he played on Billy O'Brien's teams at Penn State. I'm not sure how much he played. I don't think he was a starter, but He's a guy that I think James has known for a little bit. And so he promotes him. And I also think we have some new job titles. uh, Or I I will take those those as promotions a little bit. But Terry Smith, the corners coach, gets gets another job title. And Taylor Stubblefield, just in his second year, uh, gets another job title as well. In addition to being the wideouts coach, he's going to have some, I think, offensive uh, he's going to head up, I think, Penn, State, uh, Penn State's off, uh, recruiting on offense, big picture uh, moving forward. So your thoughts on Ty Howe and maybe your thoughts on what uh, the new job titles mean for Terry Smith and Stubblefield. Yeah, how did start a, a bit at Penn State was a team captain his last year, which was okay. the last uh, right before James Franklin's first season. So that was 2013. Um, this is a guy who, when he left Penn State, he had loads of coaching options. You know, he started out at NC State as a grad assistant. Then we remember, we'll all remember Charlie Fisher, who was on Bill O'Brien's staff. He mm-hmm. went to Western Illinois, hired Ty Howe as – a position coach, I believe it was with the offensive line to start. He was ultimately promoted to assistant or associate head coach and, you know, led the offense there as a co-offensive coordinator. So he is a rising star in this profession. When Charlie Fisher left there to, I believe, go to Arizona State, Ty Howe came back to Penn State as an off-field analyst, now is promoted. So much like it's not the same career path as Tyler Bowen, but it's pretty darn close. I mean, Tyler Bowen played under James Franklin at Maryland, started his career as a GA at Maryland, came to Penn State as a GA, then went to Fordham where he called plays under Joe Moorhead. 
ended up back at Maryland as a position coach. And then, so it's not quite the same career path, but it's pretty darn close, Bob. This is a guy who much like Tyler Bowen, a lot of people think can be a fast riser and is on the track to one day be a coordinator or maybe a head coach. And so to get him in this position now, he already has good relationships with the kids, Penn state's recruiting. Obviously they did lose one commit after Tyler Bowen left. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but Mm -hmm. I think it's a smart play just in terms of, you know this guy is going to be uh, on the upward track, I guess you could say, in terms of the future of his coaching career. And so you get him now. You He gets to experience what it's like to be an on-field coach. Mm-hmm. You know, you get him um, working with a tremendous group of tight ends. Now, I'm not saying they don't need coaching, but clearly that group is pretty darn advanced and knows what it's doing. So that helps. And Uh, again, I think the other thing is recruits know who he is and they have that familiarity. You don't have to build a new relationship with him. I think that was a big part of this as well. Okay. Uh, Well, you said it. Uh, We're talking about uh, Penn State tight ends, not only uh, present, but future tight ends. Uh, And, you know, when you talk about Penn State's 2020-2022 recruiting class, Greg, um, there was a tight end who reopened his commitment. So he was a one-time Penn state verbal, and now he's keeping his options open. Greg, usually, usually when a recruit does that, or usually, you know, usually it's not a great sign for the team. He kind of is, 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 is kind of walking away from a little bit. I guess there's still a chance. Uh, I want to make sure I pronounce his name right. Holden stays. Is that right? Yep. You got it. Dive? Stay. Okay. Stay. Got it. Um, uh, just your thoughts on him. How big of a recruit did you like him, first of all? How did he fit at Penn State? 2022 guy, but Greg, am I, am I wrong in assuming that if you op- reopen your commitment, I mean, you know, Micah Parsons did it. They still ended up with Micah Parsons, but more often than not, we've seen it at Penn State. Kid reopens his commitment. He's, he's not coming back to Penn State. Yeah, and that's basically the lay of the land. I mean, kids will usually say the right thing, that they're still going to consider the school they will they were committed to and just want to test the waters and so on and so forth. And that could certainly be the case here, but it's hard to see him coming back to Penn State. I mean, keep in mind, Penn State had a tight end commit last cycle, and its name is now completely escaped me. Uh, <laughs> Nick Elksness from Florida, uh, who opened his commit. He committed to Penn State, and then – A few months later, you know, Penn State's far away from Florida. Penn State's far away from Georgia. There's a lot of SEC interest, obviously, both for him in the last class and Holden Stays in this class. So I'm not completely sold on the idea that Holden Stays wouldn't have wanted to look around at some point anyway. So, you know, very good player. You certainly would have loved to have him as a part of your class. But Penn State's not empty handed in the position room in this cycle. They have four-star Jerry Cross from Milwaukee who's committed and seemingly has no interest in looking around despite the coaching change. So, I mean, with what Penn State brings back, they signed Khalil Dinkins in the last class. If they get Cross here, maybe they find one more guy to get in the tight end room. I don't know if it's completely required, but it couldn't hurt. So, you know, you don't want to lose four-star, especially guys who are committed to you for a while. At the same time, this is not one of those deep commitments that's, that is the end of the world. Okay. Yeah, and, you, and like you said, you know, the, it's it's weird to think that no fraud on you coming back. This guy, uh, you know, for the future opens his commitment. But yet you look at Penn State and you look at Brenton Strange and Theo Johnson staying healthy. And you mentioned uh, a kid that they signed in the 2021 20, class. Uh, James Franklin said late last year that he still has – he still thinks Zach Kuntz, who will be entering his fourth season at Penn State – uh, still has big time potential, and he may, he very well may. So it's not it's not like you know it's it, it, is it a position of strength? Maybe it's not the strongest position, but boy, those two young tight ends, if they're healthy, that that looks like it's going to be really really promising for Penn State in 2021. But I was just curious uh, about Holden Stays and maybe how much he could have helped. But it just sounds like you know sometimes when you recruit a kid in the South. Um, or, and they commit early, it's going to be hard to hold on to them once the SEC sn- starts sniffing around and, and they get interest closer to home. So we'll see. But uh, you might be right, Greg. Let's, uh, let's move on. It, I don't think there was a lot of impact with Penn State, but late last week, the Big Ten released its modified uh, 2021 schedule. They made a couple of tweaks. Um, and they still makes they still might make some more tweaks, Greg. But the latest 
uh, the latest adjustment impacts Penn State uh, not significantly, um, but there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of tweaks involving a bye week and also involving the scheduling of the Michigan and Ohio State games. So can you can you enlighten our audience about maybe how the new Big Ten schedule uh, plays out for Penn State? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a pretty big win for Penn State in the sense that you don't have Maryland or you have Maryland now rather between Michigan and Ohio State. You don't face them back to back. I thought that was important. Obviously, you know, it's still going to be a challenge and it'll be called a trap game to go to Maryland before you face uh, one of your biggest, if not the biggest, I guess the biggest rival that you have. But, um, you know, to, to get a little bit of a breather there, you would think, you know, Maryland was destroyed in the transfer portal, basically. And they don't have, you know, they had some weaknesses as it was. So to get them there, I think helps. And then the moving of the bye week, I think is important too. You know, could Penn State have used uh, where that bye was previously, October 2nd? So after the September stretch of Wisconsin, uh, Ball State, Auburn, and Villanova, which is basically a buy, um, you know, could they have used that there? Sure, I guess, to get ready for the rest of the year. But now you get it a little bit later, Bob, and I don't know where you stand on it, but I don't think it's ever a bad thing to get your bye week as late in the year as you can. Penn State's is now October 16th instead of October 2nd. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. That seems like it's, That seems like it sits almost dead in the middle or close to it of the season. And I think I'd rather, I think you'd rather have it in the, the closer it is to the middle. If you have it early in the season um, or a couple of weeks into the season, I think it's great only if it gives you an extra week to prepare for maybe uh, a really big game, especially at home, that extra week comes in handy. But in terms of maybe getting your guys healthy and getting them fresh, I think you, you probably ideally it's ideal if you can get it closer towards the middle of the season. I'm sure that's not, I have a funny feeling with the big 10, it's never quite the end of the schedule, depending on how, you know, things shake out in the next couple of months with regard to um, vaccines and, you know, handling of the pandemic, stuff like that. I mean, there's, they could always do some more reversions. I do think Greg, it's fascinating <clears throat> the way the schedule is called for now uh, to open the season on the road at Wisconsin and then to get the Auburn Tigers in week three. Um, I'm trying to remember the last time I've seen a Penn State schedule quite like that with two, you know, perceived huge tests, um, you know, that early in the season. I don't think it's – since James has been here, I don't think he's had two no. teams like that come in in the first three weeks. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Penn State's playing a Big Ten team that early in the season. But, man – um, you're going to, I think Greg, you, we're going to learn a lot, assuming the schedule stays this way. We're going to learn a lot about Penn state, uh, and the new offense early in the season. Uh, if the schedule stays that way, Greg, before we wrap it up here on the blue white breakdown, uh, I could see that I failed in my host duties because halfway through it, I'm supposed to toss it over to you. So you can tell uh, our audience what they could do to 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 review us and where we can where they can find it so i kind of blew that uh but i uh, maybe maybe just give give them a heads up and we'll close maybe with some super bowl thoughts and one quick thought maybe for penn state spring yeah so the blue white breakdown podcast you can find it wherever you get your audio pod, uh, stitcher apple google spotify you got me off my game here bob this is a little bit later than normal but that's yep. okay and uh, youtube.com slash all Penn State. You can find the video there. Bob, one more thought on the schedule. Certainly, I Love think it. the best September slate in terms of likely good games, competitive games, fun ones for fans to watch that Penn State has had in a really long time, if not ever, you know, in the modern age, modern, you know, the more modern age of football, but uh, especially in the Big Ten. But yeah, I mean, you also go back to, to the other side of that coin, which is we heard all about how. Once you have two losses, it can be tough. Um, and I'm not saying Penn State's going to lose both of these games, but there will be an underdog probably in one of them, I would think. Maybe not. We'll see. But, you know, it sets up an interesting September where you're either going to absolutely love your resume, you're going to be just okay with it, or you're going to think, oh, boy, what does the rest of the season have in store for us after just four weeks? So we'll be fascinating to see. That's a pretty good week of Big Ten games, too. I'm not sure what led to them deciding to kind of load up on marquee conference matchups in week one of 2021, but it's not just Penn State-Wisconsin on that schedule. 
Yeah. And as a general rule, just to follow up, it's even harder, Greg, to dig out of a hole when you lose your first five games. Am I right? You would be correct about that, Bob. Yeah, I, I don't see a winless start for Penn State this year. Uh, Ball State's actually going to be a pretty darn good team, though. Yeah. Uh, they come in with a lot of returning talent. Sure. But if all else fails, I think Villanova's a W. So we oh, just on don't that. fall over the Wildcats. Nice, Greg. Nice. Um, so, Greg, uh, just a couple of thoughts uh, in closing. Uh, the Super Bowl, kudos. Uh, congratulations to Chris Godwin, Donovan Smith. I think there's another – I think they had a third Penn – oh, also LaShawn McCoy, who's not a Penn Stater, but a Harrisburg guy. Congratulations, back-to-back Super Bowl wins for him. I hope I didn't miss a Penn Stater. I'm forgetting A.Q. Shipley. Oh, A.Q. Shipley. Darn it. Congrats to him. He was a really good player at Penn State. I think I think people re- – I mean, he's played, he's played in the league a long time uh, as a center. Uh, he was really good for Penn State in the, uh, in the mid-2000s. <clears throat> And Western PA Penn State fans, don't get mad at me if I had this wrong. I believe he grew up in Coropolis. It's C-O-R. And then there's a bunch of other letters in Polis and Western PA. And I think he went to Moon or Moon Township. I hope I have that right. He was a great leader, great player at center, uh, team leader, real good player. Great quote. Happy for him. Uh, you could just, it doesn't, it just kind of feels like he's going to have a career in coaching if he wants one. But congratulations to the, Tampa Bay Bucks contingent. And if you uh, Penn State fans out there had a bet- betting interest in the game, I hope you were on the right side of it. If you were on the wrong side of it, at least at least you didn't get you know beat at the last second. You were out of it early. There was no coming back. Greg, it's now, you know, we're in the second or third, second week in February. Uh, we talked to James Franklin. It was at least two weeks ago. He said he had spring practice on his calendar. He was planning on it like there was going to be a spring. Hadn't heard from the NCAA or the Big Ten. That was two weeks ago. You know, in a normal year, Greg, I think mid to late March is is usually when spring practice begins. Uh, I I do think they're they're getting in some winter conditioning, which is good. Um, Any any thoughts maybe on when Penn State spring uh, may begin and how long do you think it might be? Yeah, I think it'll be your normal 15 practices. The question is just going to be, are those spread out a little bit more than normal or not? I'm trying to remember, Bob. I want to say that they would practice like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yeah. Saturday, something like that. Uh, and so it was pretty regular when they'd be out on the field. I know because Monday is their day off. It was probably, I don't know, it was three times a week. Saturday was always one of them. And at any rate, I mean, we were always talking about that mid-March point right, right, right after spring break is over. There is no spring break this year, so that doesn't have to be factored in. But, yeah, I have not seen anything new since we uh, – you know, last talked about the fact that they feel pretty good, Sandy Barber and James Franklin, about having a traditional spring practice. But as far as I know, there's been no kind of guidelines put out about that. Obviously, if it starts in March, they won't be able to host recruits, which is no fun. So maybe teams will wait a little bit longer. Conversely, maybe some will just get off and running. I don't even know if the NCAA has to say anything, to be honest with you, Bob. I don't know. It's unless they change the rules that the rules are what they are in that you can do it. So um, I think they can probably get rolling on that whenever they like. And mid to late March seems to make the most sense with the goal being, I think in their mind and everybody else's mind to still have some practices left. If that NCAA recruiting dead period does end after April 15, that you can have some guys come to campus for the back half of your spring practice. We'll see. Got it. All right. What better way to put a bow on this edition of the Blue White Breakdown, Penn Live's Penn State Football Podcast. Hope you guys are continuing to listen and view us. Dustin Hawkinsmith still doing an awesome job with his version of it as well in the mornings. We had Dave Jones on last week. Dave and I talked about a lot of things. Not all of them were football related. I believe he is on the schedule for next week. Uh, we're going to continue tinkering with the format in the offseason. Greg and I have been discussing <clears throat> some things we might want to do with this podcast. I think next week, Greg, one thing to look out for if you guys are listening or, or watching this now, uh, I think we're going to incorporate a, uh, a subscriber mailbag element to uh, the Blue White Breakdown, or maybe we'll just be on the, on the lookout early in the week. We're going to put out a call for questions and comments that we could probably – Uh, discuss because I'm sure you guys 
have some things that we didn't get to uh, on your mind. I think we're going to do that moving forward or at least try it. But I do think this is still evolving. And uh, Greg, we talked about trying to keep this one nice and maybe maybe a little bit smaller. Try not to go over 24 minutes. We're at like 26 now. So that's a fail on my part. So before I close, Joe Hermit, theme music. And we will be back, I think, maybe with multiple Blue White Breakdowns uh, in addition to Dustin's work next week. <laughs>